And let's get straight to Nancy Cordes now, who's joining us from the White House. Uh, Nancy, thanks so much for uh, sticking around and being able to talk to us. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about reaction uh, from the White House uh, to the news of General Powell's passing, uh, and if you've also uh, seen some of the statements uh, from uh, former presidents. Yes, we're still awaiting a statement from this White House. Uh, I anticipate we'll get something fairly shortly. I also anticipate that President Biden will have something he'll want to say publicly today about his uh, former colleague and friend Colin Powell. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, we are hearing from former presidents. Uh, first and foremost, George W. Bush. Uh, as you've been discussing with David, um, Colin Powell served as Secretary of State, the first black Secretary of State under George W. Bush. He was appointed by him. And uh, Bush's statement read in part this morning that Powell was such a favorite of presidents that he earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom twice. He was highly respected at home and abroad. He was a family man and a friend. Laura and I send Alma and their children our sincere condolences as they remember the life of a great man. Uh, what's been so striking this morning in a town that seems to become more and more polarized every year is that we are seeing outpourings of respect and affection from leaders on both sides of the aisle. So uh, Mitt Romney, for instance, the Republican senator from Utah put out a statement saying that uh, the nation lost a man of undaunted courage and a champion of character. He was devoted to America and the cause of liberty. Uh, Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia said that he was a patriot and a public servant. And that's just a sort of a flavor of, of what you're seeing from both sides of the aisle this morning. Colin Powell, someone who really um, cut such a unique character uh, here in Washington. He was someone who was so uh, highly respected uh, on both sides that he was encouraged at various points to run for president by both figures on the left and on the right. and. His endorsement was highly valued, uh, particularly in the early 2000s. I remember sort of so many people waiting with bated breath to see who Colin Powell was going to endorse in 2008. Was it going to be John McCain or was it going to be Barack Obama? That is how important his views and um, his stamp of approval was at that time given everything that he had co accomplished in his political and military career. And Nancy, of course, there are going to be sort of tributes um, pouring in all day long, but we do have um, some video of Secretary of Defense General Lloyd Austin reacting to the news of Colin Powell's passing. I want to play that. The world lost one of the greatest leaders that we have ever witnessed. Um, Alma lost a great husband and the family lost a tremendous father. And I lost uh, a tremendous personal friend and mentor. Uh, he has been my mentor for a number of years. Uh, he always made time for me, and I could always go to him with, with tough issues. He always had great, uh, great counsel. Uh, we, we will certainly miss him. I feel as if I have a hole in my heart uh, just, just learning of this uh, just recently. First African American uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, first African American Secretary of State, a man who was respected around the globe and who will be, uh, quite frankly, it is not possible to replace a Colin Powell. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, those words are probably, many, many people are probably feeling um, the words that he expressed there. And we are going to continue to uh, cover this story as we receive word from uh, others um, throughout Colin's uh, life and career. We Colin Powell's life and career. We will bring that to you. But right now, we do have some other news that we uh, we're going to get to. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, um, Nancy. Um, I want to ask you about another sort of big story that we've all been watching since the weekend. Um, these Americans and one Canadian who are being held hostage in Haiti. American officials and authorities are working to free them. We're talking about 17 hostages. They were kidnapped in Port-au-Prince, Haiti over the weekend by a gang that is known to be violent, known to kidnap priests and nuns 
We know the State Department is in contact with senior Haitian officials regarding the kidnapping, but what more can you tell us about what the U.S. is doing to free these hostages? And Marie, what I can tell you is that typically in these situations, when you have Americans who are kidnapped abroad, it is the FBI that takes the lead. Uh, and specifically in this case, it would most likely be the FBI uh, office based in Miami, since they are typically the ones who are dispatched to Haiti. But beyond that, there is still so much we don't know about this case. Uh, we don't know, for instance, what these kidnappers are seeking. Are they seeking money? Probably how much? We don't know. We don't know whether U.S. authorities are already negotiating with them, whether they are willing to pay that ransom. Uh, you know, such a brazen crime. It's a, a criminal gang in Haiti that is suspected. And it, kidnappings have sadly been uh, uh, dramatically on the rise in Haiti. But typically, the gangs tend to steer clear of Americans. They don't want to mess with the American government. And that is what makes this particular kidnapping so shocking, the fact that uh, almost all of the individuals who were kidnapped are Americans. Some of them are children, and they were kidnapped uh, as they were doing missionary work. So uh, a really horrifying situation there. And it is um, causing human rights activists to argue once again that this is why they feel that Haitians who have fled the country because of the chaos and deteriorating conditions there should not be returned to that country because it is so dangerous. There are, it's almost hard to fathom here in the U.S., but kidnappings have become a regular occurrence, not just for foreign nationals, but just people going about their daily lives. Uh, women and children in their homes uh, are, are kidnapped for uh, all sorts of, of reasons. These gangs that, uh, by some estimates, now control at least half of Port-au-Prince, um, a, a really lawless situation there, uh, and it's certainly going to put more pressure on this White House, even as it works to try to secure the safety of these individuals uh, when it comes to Haiti policy. And, and it's going to reignite all these arguments about whether the U.S. should should be sending troops into Haiti to, to sort of establish uh, a, a safer situation and also what should be done about the thousands of Haitians who have amassed uh, either at the U.S. border, who have tried to get to the U.S. border, who have been turned away from the U.S. border, seeking safety. Uh, all important context there, uh, Nancy. We'll be waiting to see ultimately what happens, uh, and we'll obviously speak to our correspondent, Manny Bohorkas, who's actually in Port-au-Prince reporting on the ground. Um, let me ask you about some other news coming out of Washington. Uh, Congress returns today uh, after its break. Uh, the president's spending package, as, as you know, set off a very public dispute between Senators Joe Manchin and Senators Bernie Sanders. Um, what are the two sides saying? What could we expect this week as Congress returns to work? Well, this is sort of a, an interesting situation that cropped up over the weekend. As you know, Senator Sanders of Vermont, Senator Manchin of West Virginia are on uh, the two opposite sides of this argument within the party. Senator Sanders wanted a package that was much larger than the one that the White House even uh, unveiled when it comes to social spending, new social programs. And Senator Manchin is locked in negotiations with the White House over trying to make it much smaller. Well, uh, Sanders sort of took matters into his own hands over the weekend. He posted an op-ed in Senator Manchin's hometown paper in West Virginia, arguing that all of these programs that are in the bill are extremely popular uh, with wide swaths of the American public, particularly with Democrats, uh, the party that Manchin belongs to. And as you can imagine, Manchin did not appreciate this. Uh, he said he was not basically going to be taking direction from a self-avowed Democratic socialist and kind of rejected Sanders' argument. But this just sort of shows how personal things are getting as these negotiations drag on week after week without any outward appearance of progress. Democrats growing increasingly frustrated that, um, that the White House continues to appear to move closer and closer to Manchin and Cinema's positions, but they don't see a lot of movement 
in the other direction. And time is now running short if Democrats want to meet this new self-imposed deadline after the old self-imposed deadline went by the wayside to try to pass this major package that's at the heart of the president's agenda by the end of the month. That's a really tall order when you consider the negotiations are still going on. We still don't have a bill written. We don't know what it's going to look like. And then it would have to be debated and passed in, in the House and then in the Senate. So things are um, uh, really in flux right now. And it's going to be a very crucial week with lawmakers coming back to Capitol Hill. All right, Nancy, thank you very much. You're welcome.